Um, all right. Is there anyone's report? Is there anyone who does not want me to discuss their report? All I have are initials, so I don't know who is who. Quite frankly, I'm just going to put up some reports on the screen. Um, we forgot to plug in the USB cable. There we are. All the uh, studies went well last night. I think I just have to restart my PowerPoint. Okay. So this is a summary of uh, what we had last night. So if you look at the overall number, we have 15, we did 15 tests last night. So normally in your practice, you're going to do one or two. I don't know, Gloria, what's the most you've ever done in one night? How many, how many have you ever sent out routines? Have you ever done three in one night? Okay. Um, so what we look here is within normal limits, you have three. And then if we look at uh, how many people had mild sleep apnea, everybody was obstructive in nature. How many we have mild? We have seven here. And then we had four moderates and then one severe. Now this is the overall apnea hypopnea index. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through some of the reports and we're going to look at it in more detail why you want to pay attention to things like body position. Because when we do that and we look at the overall, we look at just supine apnea hypopnea index, the numbers change. So when we look at supine AHI, we had uh, five people that were within normal limits, two were mild, five were moderate, and three were severe. So it's quite interesting to see that. Now the total apnea hypopnea index ranged from a low of 1.6 to a high of 46.4, that's overall. And the supine ranged from 0 to 47.2, which means some people here had an AHI essentially of 0 while on their back. And other people went as high as 47, which is in the severe range. And the number of desaturations of 4% or more ranged from 10, a low of 10, to 358. That means 358 occurrences of blood oxygen levels dropping at least 4%. Any questions on this part so far? 358 on one person, that's correct. The question was, was it 358 on one person? Yes. So one person had only 10 uh, peripheral oxygen desaturations, and another person had 358. So this presentation is kind of on the fly because I have to jump between different programs. So I'm going to load up. An example of a good. We'll start with someone who had an AHI of, I think, overall 2.8, which is within normal limits. Let me load up. Here's the Microsoft Word report. I'm going to zoom in. Can you see that okay at the back of the room? Is that large enough? Okay. So this is page one. It's a two-page report. We do have like three-page reports, and you can customize them and so on and so forth, but it's a Microsoft Word document. The, um, and I th thank you, Gloria, and, and everyone else for downloading the data. So it's quite a bit of work to do 15, all within the span of a few hours. It um, takes about five minutes to download, but it's more of moving data around and collating everything. So this, you, you'd have a, we just put the, the month and the day and then initials, but you would have the real patient's name here and the biographics, and we, we did not, as I mentioned earlier, did not complete the biographics, but it will calculate BMI and waist to hip ratio is actually a better measure of, of uh, whether a person is overweight than in fact BMI. Um, the apnea hypopnea index, 2.8, and if you look at the legend to the right, anything less than five is considered within normal limits. For an, adult, for an adult. The respiratory disturbance index is six. 
that's still low. Anything below 10, I would still consider for an RDI within normal limits. And um, so the RDI includes the apneas, the hypopneas, plus the flow limitation and the RERA events that we talked about yesterday. So this section here uh, just describes what was used for the test, and that's just something useful to send out. If you send a copy of this to the physician, when you scroll down the report, here we have a breakdown of uh, the SPO2 or the pulse oximetry. I just highlighted a couple spots in yellow. You notice we're essentially hitting a ceiling effect right here between 90 and 100 percent of 99.9. .9. So what I've noticed uh, in the past is on milder cases, even moderate, you'll often get you know, 99.9, 98.9, so you're almost hitting a ceiling effect. And in, in many of the reports you're going to see out there, they break the SpO2 down in 10% increments. Um, anything considered less than 88 is uh, often what a pulmonologist will consider clinically significant. Um, that's really where they start getting concerned when the SPO2 is the time below 88% for the entire recording. So in the past, what I've noticed is that for mild and moderates, we often hit a ceiling effect between 90 and 100%. So I've broken it down into 2% increments. So I highlighted the mode, and the mode is the most common. And the most common here is between 96 and 98%, almost 52% of the night. This person was between 96 and 98%. Uh, blood oxygen saturation. So what we want to do is Sunday morning we're going to compare the night with the Moses, even uh, compared to this baseline night, and we'll see what happens with these numbers. Here we're not going to see much change. From 99.9 .9, the most we're going to see is to what, 100% perhaps. That's what we hope. But we also hope to see the mode improve here or increase. So we'll see what happens here. We've had that experience in the past with, with these courses. To the right, we see the number of desaturations of 4% or more. There's a total of 10, which is, again, low, right? Because earlier we said that one person here has 358. So we'll take a look at that. And then people that were mild and moderate are in between those two numbers. The mean, I usually don't pay as much attention to the mean um, because I find that you're looking at one number a second. Like we sample at something like 75 times a second and then it averages out to one a second, so it stores one SpO2 value every second. Whereas the audio, the snore microphone that we used last night, we actually sample at 2,000 samples a second. So you, we have a lot more numbers to work with on the audio, of course. Because the SpO2, um, I generally don't pay a lot of attention to the mean, only because you might see a profound improvement in AHI or a profound improvement in a reduction in the number of desaturations, but the mean might only change by one. And a good number of those to look at is the, the minimum, what's called the L, some people call that the LSAT or the lowest saturation. So this person actually at one point went to 87, probably because they've rolled over, moved around. This is a pulse rate table. Um, if you have someone with uh, more severe sleep apnea, you'll often see bradytachycardia. So during the event, you'll often see bradycardia where the heart rate goes below 60. And at the end, you'll often see tachycardia with the autonomic nervous system arousal at the termination of the respiratory disturbance. So this is uh, nothing really here to get excited about. It's all within normal limits. Yes? Um, yeah, I think that's a typo. I think it's supposed to be... Oh, that's not supposed to be percent. That's supposed to be beat per minute. Sorry, that's a typo. Yeah, it's supposed to be BPM. Thank you for pointing that out. If we go to page two, we have a lot of information here, a lot of detailed information. There's some areas where you, you, know, you may not choose to focus too much on. Um, let's start at the top here with the respiratory table. So we have number of breaths. So if you're doing somewhere between 12 and, say, 12 breaths per minute, 12 to 16, you're going to end up with around 6,000. This person had just under 7,000, so that's perfect. That's your number of breaths per hour. Uh, the mean, minimum, maximum, duration. Number of central apneas, and again, measures of central tendency, mean, min, max. Two obstructive apneas, 
16 hypopneas, no mixed. Um, total, 21 apneas plus hypopneas. The SSD is a snoring sound events where we actually define the snore as greater than 60 decibels for at least a quarter of a second in duration. Because in fact, there is no definition of a snore. If you look it up in a textbook, you're not going to find it. So we, we actually score snoring two different ways. One, using the cannula, we can get the high frequency vibrations or oscillations in, in the waveform during inhalation and exhalation. So that's one way we can describe. It's more like a nasal resistance or, or resistance to flow or vibration associated with the flow. And the second me method is the snoring sound, so the intensity of the sound. So that's what we call snoring sound events, SSD, and that's more the snoring nasal resistance, the snoring flow from the cannula. So sounds are from the microphone, flow is from the cannula. So that just breaks down the total numbers. Flow limitation events, that's a total number. Um, Desaturations, again, we mentioned earlier, it's only 10. And then your number of re-res are respiratory effort-related arousals. So the re-res are, are events, and if you have lots of those and lots of flow limitation, then you can often have upper airway resistance syndrome. And the events is a breakdown of the total respiratory events by body position. So this is really where it's, if you see the supine, and you look down, apnea plus hypopnea index, or AHI by body position, if your supine is generally two times greater than non-supine, or more than two times greater, then we, we would say that there is definitely a positional component to the apnea. So if you have someone who has a, a, a non-supine index of you know, 2.5, and their supine index was 20, or even 10, you definitely have a, a, a positional component means that when they're on their back, they're definitely sleeping a lot worse. So one of the simple instructions there is don't sleep on your back. And if they're, if they're non-supine while they are, um, if let's say that AHI was, was 12, uh, non-supine, and supine it was 36, then you can combine positional therapy with oral appliance therapy because they still need to take care of the apnea apoptea index even when they're not on their back. Uh, snoring volume table to the upper right, that is kind of, think of this as the opposite of the SpO2 table, whereas SpO2, you want the numbers to go up towards the top. In this case, we want the numbers to go down. So the lower, the higher the numbers at the low end of this table, the better, because that's the low end. We're, we're measuring decibels between 40 and 100. We've broken it down into 10% increments. And uh, what we do at this point is uh, we measure the amount of time the person is in uh, each, each grouping. So if the person is 100% um, of the time below 60, we generally say, well, there's definitely no snoring. This person is very close to 100% below 60. And the one thing about the, the dB scale, the decibel scale, is it is logarithmic. So the power increase between, say, 60 and 70 is like a threefold increase in power. It's, it's an exponential scale. It's not linear. Um, that mean, um, again, that's just an average. I don't put too much emphasis on the average, but I have seen it a significant drop, and you see the average maybe drop by 5. But again, because it's an exponential scale, a 5 dB drop overall is significant. Now, the breath statistics... Um, Again, total number of breaths, which you also see here. See here. And then we added uh, with flow limitation, with flow limitation or snoring sound events, and then the percentage of flow limited breaths, and then the percentage of flow limited breaths or with snoring sound. So what I've often seen is on some of these courses, you might get 50%. This number might be, in fact, instead of 14.7, it might be 50. And then with the appliance, we're actually able to get that down to, say, 25, which is, which is quite impressive. So... Think of this table as a, a way to look at the milder types of sleep disordered breathing. The flow limitation, the reras. Because as dentists, you're going to be dealing a lot with those kind of cases. Sleep labs typically don't give you this kind of information. Some might, but on the snoring table, they won't give you this. We do manufacture, I think we manufacture the only product that actually enables sleep labs to use this type of technology and plug it into their sleep lab systems. Very few sleep labs ever delve into this level of detail in snoring or flow limitation because we're looking at 
a breath by breath analysis here. So the software goes through on a breath by breath basis because you're not going to count 6,875 6, breaths. The software does that for you and it looks at the slope of the line and it determines whether there's a plateau on, on the slope and whether it's flat. What we talked about yesterday with the flow limitation on the laminated guide. Uh, the interesting thing here, so um, I think Alan might want to make a comment about because um, he's asked Gloria to add the number of breaths per minute. So that's not calculated automatically by our software, that, that number of 15.31 in this example. That, that was actually added in by Gloria. So did you want to? No, that's, that's, and that's right in the range that we would expect normal breathing. And so I would not, that wouldn't set off any red lights. Now, there was a report earlier that we'll speak to later because I don't, I don't want to detract from this. But the thing, the, the, the conception, the misconception, or, the, or the, let's say the, the concept that I hear at, at universities, they'll say, well, when you see positional apnea, that's the one that's most predictable with success with an oral appliance. So they say, if you have that positional component, they're right in there ready to do uh, uh, oral appliance therapy. But the fact of the matter is that I would not use that as an excuse not to make an oral appliance. I would make the oral appliance, but the oral appliance will be more effective if we institute positional therapy would be the way I look at it. Because uh, I expect to get some reduction in all the apneas because basically my concept is that we're dilating the airway. We're not just dilating the airway in a supine position. And so I feel that, uh, yeah, so there's nothing wrong with introducing positional therapy, um, but use it advantageously and not as the main treatment at the exclusion of an oral appliance. I, again, I'm never recommending looking for an excuse not to make an oral appliance when they send the patient for one. What they're thinking is, ha, ah, positional, it's a perfect candidate. So don't, don't, don't argue that with the guy who's referring by trying to do only positional. Okay. The, the other point I want to make before I close off on the snoring, uh, typically from a sleep lab, the most you'll get is a sentence, and it'll say, or not even, two words, loud snoring. That's, that's the extent that you often get a report back from a sleep lab where they'll, that's their detailed investigation into snoring. Yet that's usually the number one complaint from the bed partner, and we've discussed that already quite a bit this weekend. So here's a breakdown of uh, the graphical details of the entire night. So the very top, we have the volume table. And you see here, there's very low snoring. The SpO2 is flat all night long. These little dropouts here are usually associated with like body position changes. So the software automatically goes through and, and calculates that and removes it. So it omits it from the statistical calculations. Can I just add one more point there? That in my experience, in our experience, the better that um, a receiver, the better the uh, finger uh, probe? probe is attached, the more tape you use, the fewer dropouts, period. Do it, tape it, tape it, and retape it. If you can get them to do that, you just have fewer dropouts. Because, again, what's going to happen is eventually, the person's going to walk, look at this chart sitting on the desk, and they're going to go, uh, Will you explain that to me? And then you have to stop and explain. Nothing wrong with it, it's all, but, but you don't have to if, they, if it's not there because it's already been eliminated and it's just an artifact. Well, you don't want them to think there's too many artifacts in anything we do. This is just tape, tape, and retape is the, is the clinical clue here. Yeah, in that, in that eight hours, those little dropouts probably represent like three or four seconds each, so they're really negligible. Um, this is your pulse rate. So again, it's generally flat all night long. You get a little bit of uh, changes. Particularly, it's a little bit more variable during REM sleep. Each tick mark here marks the occurrence of an event. So if you look on the left-hand column, OA stands for obstructive apnea, CA is central apnea, MA is mixed apnea. The uh, HY is hypopnea. D stands for desaturation. RERA, respiratory effort related arousals. SSD is a snoring sound events. SNR is a snoring nasal resistance. FL is flow limitation. And beneath that you have 
the graphical representation of body how position. How do you get from SSD and SNR? Is that a separate measurement flow limitation, or is that derived from the other two? Flow limitation is the, it comes from the oral nasal cannula. The SNR comes from the oral nasal cannula. Uh, the how SS do you differentiate? How does, conceptually, how is the computer differentiating that? I mean, well, the, the SSD is, is a snoring volume, right? That's, that's the intensity that's, that's of the sound. Volume that's is volume recorded from the microphone. And that microphone ha records loudness? Or what is it, what is intensity, it? sound intensity. So, but it's, okay. But it's sound intensity without a microphone. No, no, it is the microphone. The, the SSD event is scored from the microphone. Okay. SNR is just... It's reason. from the high frequency vibrations or oscillations in okay. the flow, airflow waveform. I'll show, I'll show you that on, okay. the, on the graphs. Body position, so left side, right side, supine, prone, standing. Generally, you see standing only if someone gets up and goes to the washroom. And then at the bottom, just anything you can mark as bad data. So the computer automatically marks the bad SpO2 dropouts that occur, and it omits that from the calculations. And then... If you wanted to, you could actually score brainwave frequencies, which I've done, and mark any periods of wakefulness uh, and exclude those so you can actually get a total sleep time as opposed to a total recording time. That's optional. It's, not, it's usually more for advanced users. Any questions on any of this so far? So there's one thing else I want to point out, mm -hmm. and that is that, again, that microphone to me is not red, it's golden. And the reason it's so golden is because you can come over here and in the page, well, what is this the snoring? What does it sound like? My wife's complaining, is it, is it really that bad? And so, for example, I could say, what, let's, let's say, it looks like that's the loudest snore. That may or may not be. That could be a cough, which will come out loud. But the point is, you can go back, on the, on the, not, on the, not on the Word document printout, but you can go back to the hypnogram on the score sheet, at the bottom of the score sheet, and you can click on that. And when you click on that and then highlight the snore, you're listening to that snore. Patients can be, you can bring in the operatory, your patient can be sitting in your consultation room with you, and they're listening to their snores. Nothing has a wake-up call like listening to their snores. It is, no one else has this feature. It is absolutely gold, because when they're done, I'm going to sit them down again. I'm going to say, okay, listen to how it sounded before. Now, pick out the loudest snores in the night after. And because they don't understand 50 decibels, and the decibels are logarithmic, isn't it? Well, this it's, is all nothing. But when they listen, their ear, and they hear that snoring, it's, oh my God, thank you. Now I know what my bed partner is going through. This is where this really excels. Okay, next. So let's Sorry. take a look at this screenshot. And um, does anybody see any flat lines on the waveform channels? So this is the raw data. We just looked at the summary. So if you look here, you see any flat lines? No. So that's perfect breathing. It's all rhythmic. Remember yesterday we talked about the sinusoidal waveforms? So you can't get any better than that. But just by way of discussion here, if I can interrupt, if I were to go over to this one here with the patient and I were to click, because that looks like the loudest event of the night, and there, well... Now we're going to scale. They're moving. And then we're going to say, okay, can we highlight this and listen? You have to click on the speaker button. Speaker button. Right there. And we're going left to click and highlight. That's a cough. Okay, a cough again. So the loudest sound of the night was a cough, and you want to pick a snore. You may get a cough again. I'm going to suspect that these are probably some snores. And so, let's wait for that one. Okay, and so maybe the snoring isn't the big problem there, but 
Again, this is the kind of thing you could do. You have the capability of looking at these events. And they're worth looking at because look what's going on here. You have this whole picture where when he's talking about the flow, the, the, the high volume, what did you say, high frequency of airflow? Mm -hmm. The there's oscillations, the, There's yeah. high frequency oscillation, high frequency oscillation. It's corresponding to an event here. It's corresponding to an event here. And so this is all information as to what's going on. Does anyone have any questions on the good sleeper, or the, at least a good breather during sleep? Hmm? That's not Bob, no. <laughs> so let's jump to the other end of the spectrum. Okay. So now you'll notice, let me just jump over here. And you'll notice there's events highlighted on the screen. So what we have here are uh, hypopneas. I just entered that comment where it says good hypopneas and snoring. So just to go back to Alan's point, we'll highlight a couple of these snores and play them. What I want you to do is listen to the difference in intensity at the uh, termination and in the beginning. This is partial breathing. This is a hypopnea. That's your recovery breathing. see by the intensity at the top it starts going down again in volume so that's a repeat repeat of the cycle so you can see how it's loud quiet loud quiet loud loud quiet loud quiet and if you have a sound meter you can yeah. actually play that back um, for your patients so I think I've got one over here these sound these I have right here but this is mine uh, we I had one and it was recording on C and he's got an A and I was jealous so he had an A so I went and bought this about 25 bucks on Amazon, and you can set it for maximum range or minimum, and this thing is incredibly sensitive. And so typically the way I would calibrate is if I looked up here, for example, and I saw that that snore hit, I can't see it there, I'll look on the screen, but on the screen, that snore looks like it, I can't read it, it's still too small whatever that is, then, but if it hits 90 decibels, let's say. So then, what I'm gonna do, if that, if that says 90, then I'm gonna calibrate the volume on the computer so that it's coming out 90. So that patient's sitting there, they're listening to it as it sounds in bed. What you heard may not be what it sounds like in bed because we didn't calibrate the microphones yet. Okay, and that's cool because it's, what, it's not, is it a loud snore or does it obnoxious sound? It's what does it sound like to someone sleeping this far away? And you can calibrate your speakers. And this, this is nothing. It's cool. So that snore reached 81 decibels. Yeah. So here's, one. here's his version. It looks like it does the same thing, but hey. So these are all in the same price range. And you see a picture of it, you don't know if you're getting this or this, but it doesn't make any difference. So here's another example, and I'll play these ones. Now if I jump, this is only a 30 second window, this entire rectangle here is 30 seconds. 
if I jump out to back to five minutes, this shows you now five minutes of the entire night. So if we start at the top, this is your audio channel. This is the microphone. So this is the raw audio. And the next is the volume in decibels between 40 and 100. So that first dashed line here is 60 decibels. And the higher dashed line there is 80. The next waveform here is a snoring from the airflow cannula, which is a vibrations. So you see here how they correlate with the sound rather well. This is the airflow signal from the oral nasal cannula. The next one is the oral nasal thermal airflow. So this uh, flow from the cannula is better at detecting hypopneas and flow limitation and UARS. The one below that is better at detecting apneas. That's just a technology thing and that's actually one of the recommendations in, from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. The chest effort signal, you can still see there's continued respiratory or ventilatory effort, so we know it's obstructive while there's a partial reduction in airflow. Same with the abdominal. The sum channel shows that it's just a change in the waveform. It kind of uh, more closely reflects the airflow signal. Here we have the uh, peripheral oxygen level from the finger probe. And these are, each highlighted area is a desaturation of at least 4% or more. So if I put my mouse over that, the software actually tells you how much their oxygen level went down. So on this one here, if I do a mouse over and I put it on top, it comes up and tells me that's a 9% desaturation. And then you can see it goes back up here, and then here it goes back down 10%. If I go to the next page or the previous page, you can see the whole cycle is repetitive. So on this particular five minute window, so this is five minutes right here, this entire rectangle. And that five minutes corresponds to this thick black line right here. And this is the entire night. This is the beginning of the recording, and this is the end of the recording at this end. The SPO2, you'd want it to look like this all night long, flat, continuously flat. But you can see here, as soon as this person goes to bed, they're going up and down, up and down. Then it's a little bit flat there, and there's more problematic. And it's at its worst later in the night, which is what you'd expect because you have more REM sleep later in the night. And that's when you have your muscle paralysis during REM sleep. So let's take a look at the report. Any questions on any of this so far? This is the raw data, yes. And, and when you download the data, the raw data is put on your, uh, your local computer. Okay, so the first page again, the very first thing that jumps out at you is the apnea hypopnea index is 46.4. It's greater than 30, therefore it's severe. So according to all the published guidelines, this person should be on going on CPAP as a first line of treatment. The uh, RDI is 58.2. If we scroll down, we can compare this to the previous case. 300, can you see that okay in the back? Respiratory disturbance index. That is the apneas plus hypopneas plus RERAs. Whereas the AHI is just the apneas plus hypopneas. The insurance companies, most of them only will pay for AHI and they won't pay for RDI. Because if they did pay for RDI, almost everybody would be getting CPAP or some type of you know, coverage from their insurance companies and they wouldn't want that. And the insurance companies also typically go with a 4% desaturation. Because if you do use the 3% rule, that's defined by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, your AHI will actually change. It may, in fact, be higher. So there's some controversy about that in the literature that you can read about. So if we look here, what will jump out at you is the number of desaturations, 358 versus 10 in the previous case. Can I just, one thing here is, we're, when, when Rick is talking about this for 3 to 4 percent, listen carefully. What we're saying is that there's articles, but the, the 4 percent is being determined by insurance companies. This is being determined... So what really happens is money is the determining factor on a lot of this, and we're dealing in arbitrary definitions and not scientific definitions, and it all evolves around money. And so the, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of dollars and cents around this, and, and there's less science than you might think. We know what we're talking about, but even who defined 5 to 15 as mild? 
we, I, I was looking at a 15 there that was quite serious because the average event was 37 seconds. So to me, if your average event is 37 seconds, you only have 15, that's the equivalent of 130 seconds, equivalent of 310 seconds in terms of the physiologic damage to the body. So there's a, a lot of arbitrary stuff here that's just arbitrarily defined because somebody said so. It's not like there's any science to say, well, the consequences of mild are this. Later on, they go back and take this and do some research, but we're not at that point in this profession yet. It's a lot of arbitrary definitions. You listen to what they're saying, and it's there. It's the, it, should, it hits me over the head. Um, I'm not satisfied with a lot of this. But, you know, again, understand when you're talking, you're talking arbitrary definitions like there. Okay, sorry. So if we take a closer look at the breakdown of the SpO2 table, what you'll see is that the mode is now just barely, you know, it's quite close between 90 and 92% at 32.3, and then between 92 and 94% at 33% of the night. So the mode is between 92 and 94, so I think there's an opportunity. It's going to be interesting to see tomorrow morning what happens with the oral appliance. Hopefully those numbers will go up, and we want to see this number here, between 80 and 89 percent, we really want to see those numbers drop. Because the total below 88 percent, 7.4 percent of the night. So this person's getting a real workout in their sleep. Instead of their body getting the restoration and that they're supposed to be getting, they're getting quite a workout. Any questions on any of this so far? Uh, we don't measure sleep per se, but what we, are, what we do is we measure um, the SpO2, when you, put the, when you put the probes on, that's basically the point we mark as lights out, that we start saying this is when the recording starts. So what we typically do in the sleep lab is we say to you, we hook you all up with all the equipment, we turn the lights out, put you in bed, and we call that lights out, and then when we wake you up in the morning, we call that lights on. Sometimes people are already awake, maybe for two or three minutes, you know, before we wake them up. And so what we do in that case is that's called total recording time. And when we look at brain waves and eye movements and muscle tone, as we discussed yesterday, that's how we would then determine sleep stages. That's the technically correct way to do it. If I scroll down to page two, we'll take a look now at more detailed data on the uh, respiratory events. So there was no, there was in this case 7,000, almost 7,500 breaths, no central apneas, almost everything was a hypopnea. Um, if we look down, we've got the total number of desaturations, 89 reras, snoring volume, 0.2% of the night between 80 and 90, 1.3% between 70 and 80, 5.3% between 60 and 70. So we'll see what happens tomorrow with the snoring volume. That's how it's shown graphically. Now, if we look at the supine and non-supine AHI, they're both in the severe range, 32 versus 51. And then tomorrow we'll take a look at the number of percentage of flow-limited breaths. It's right now it's at 41%. We'd like to see that number go down. And there's a graphical representation of the entire night. Quite a few body movements right here, so not necessarily the best night. You can often tell how well somebody slept based on the number of body position changes. I did a recording once on someone who used to uh, be in the Navy, and they just they didn't even roll over once the entire night for six hours straight in one position. It was just an incredible, I think it was like a 99% sleep efficiency. It was very rare to get someone like that. Okay, so here's the raw data on this person. So here you can see we've got some good hypopneas. So you notice how we see, if you remember that laminated chart we discussed yesterday, here's your recovery breath, hypopnea, recovery breath, hypopnea, recovery breath, hypopnea. Now we know it's a hypopnea, but on from two ways. One, we still, have, we still have airflow here, and the thermistor here also confirms we have airflow. Now the desaturations here, this desaturation is caused by this respiratory disturbance, this desaturation is caused by this one, and so on. There's a bit of a lag. Because we're on the periphery of the body, there's maybe a 15 to 20 second lag. If we were on the earlobe, the lag would be shorter. 
and our SpO2 percentage, might, the baseline might be a bit higher, but we'll still see the desaturations. So you might talk to some pulmonologists, if they're old school, and they're in probably in their 50s or 60s, and they're really old school, they might still be using earlobe SpO2 probes. We have those. We typically don't use them by default, but if you do have a person, a patient who has acrylics or refuses to, I had this, uh, we did this, I think in 2007, I was in San Diego, and one of the attendees refused to, she just spent a couple hundred dollars on her nails, and they were dark, dark, so that would reflect the light. Anything that would reflect the light or interfere with the light going, being transmitted through the fingers and through the capillaries will reduce the effectiveness of the, uh, of the finger probe. So in that case, we just used an earlobe probe. And if you look through the entire night here in the recording, so you've got desaturations, and then all of a sudden it's better here, then you've got desaturations, it's a bit better, desaturations again, and then it's better. So we'll take a closer look at that. This is interesting. I put a comment here. Note position change right there. And you see how here you have hypopneas and it just, that wheel of death, so to speak, continues to repeat itself. But look what happens when we go after the person changes position. They reduce in intensity to the point where they go away. And then they go, they roll over again, then it comes back. And of course, you could pick any event here and play it. So if people often ask me, how do you know they're asleep? Well, they're snoring. Also, a lot of times the patients will say that, how, how do you know, I, I thought I woke up at 6.30 because you have a nice, you know, the clock on there. And, and he'll say, well, I think you, you were asleep here because you just had two apneic events. If you stop breathing, I think if you're awake, you would know it if you stopped breathing. So the overall AHI was 29. So just below the cutoff for severe. And I remember on the first case we had 10 desaturations with an AHI of 2.6, and now we had, then we had uh, 358 with an AHI of 46.4, now we have 159 with an AHI of 29, so it all makes sense. The mode here is between 92 and 94, it's almost 58%. We want to see that number go up, and also here, there's still 3.2% of the night below 88%. So again, it all fits. We'll go to the next page. So the respiratory disturbances, again, no centrals, and almost all hypopneas. Snoring table, 0.5% of the night between 80 and 90, 3% between 70 and 80, 3.3% between 60 and 70. So we want to see those numbers improve. We want them to go down tomorrow. But let's take a closer look at the body position. AHI by body position, because this jumped out at me when I was looking at it. Usually, when you have positional apnea, it's supine versus non-supine, and I said earlier that if the AHI when you're supine is at least twice as, uh, two times more, or two times greater or more than the uh, non-supine AHI, then you've got a positional apnea component. But here, there's 0.1% of the night supine, so really there's nothing. There's no supine sleep, and the AHI is all non-supine. But look at the difference, left side versus right side. Here we have almost half and half the night was spent on each side. So 49.7% of the night on the right, 50.2% on the left. So it's almost a 50-50 split. But look at the difference in AHI. Basically 11 versus 47 and a half. So that's where, you'd want to, that's where you want to have a conversation with the patient. If you happen to have the cone beam scanner, then certainly take a look and say, hey, so what's going on? Is there, how are you breathing out when you're on your, on your left side? Isn't there a predominance of 
people being worse on their left side than their right side in the general population? I thought I read that. Well, not to this extent. No, not to this extent, but there is some. It has to do with the heart being on the left yeah, side. Yeah, I've heard of that as well, but um, not, not to that extent. There's something no, else going on. Certainly, yeah. that's unusual. So th in this case, this person, you'd say, don't sleep on your left side. And you still need an oral appliance because even on your right side, you're at 11. So again, combination therapy, perhaps. We can look more into that perhaps tomorrow. Any questions on that so far? Okay, I'll open up another one. So the AHI in this case was 22.2. The number of desaturations are 63. I think the last case we looked at had about 158. What's interesting here is there's very little time below 88%. So if we look here, it's only 0.5% of the night. Again, we're almost hitting a ceiling effect, 99.5% of the night between 90 and 100% SpO2. Let's take a closer look at the body position. And here we have a clear-cut case of the supine being much worse than the non-supine. So when this person's on their back, they're almost at an AHI of 46 on supine. And they spent 41% of the night on their back. So that's not insignificant. So they spent a good chunk of the night on their back. HI was severe on their back. So you've got a gravity's taking effect. Non-supine, their HI was six. So it's borderline, it's mild. Still, they should probably treat it, particularly if we take a look at the snoring and if they're complaining of snoring. So here's another case where you might want to combine oral appliance therapy with positional therapy. There's a lot of positional therapy products available commercially. You can get t-shirts that have like a styrofoam cylinder that fits in a pocket in the back. There's other ones that wrap around your waist. There's the old tennis ball or street hockey ball trick in a pair of stockings. So there's a number of different techniques you can use. The bottom line is whatever you use, you want it to encourage the person to keep off their back. We need a microphone. It's on. Okay. So if you could scroll back up a bit, there was some central apneas there. That yeah, I'd have to go double check that on the software I was looking at. I think it scored centrals off the chest belt, and I'd want to take another look at that. But again, the number is so low when you compare it. I would only really get excited about centrals as if it was at least 50% of all the overall events. So if I add up the total events here of 133, it's only saying 23. So you'd still treat the majority of the events as obstructive in nature. Now here's one that's going to be interesting only because we did this person back in March as well. And when I spoke with him earlier today, he confirmed that uh, when we did the recording, when we did the recording in March, he came up at 17.3. And this time he came up at 17.1. So that's something to be said for consistency. And again, you had 70, 60 saturations of 4% or more. And there's a slight positional component with the supine AHIs, almost 26, and non-supines about 16. But the snoring is a pretty good intensity here, so let's take a look at that. If I go to the raw data and open that up very quickly. We can go here, zoom in on any section, and actually play a bit of the raw data. So we've got some good uh, sawing of wood going on there. So with an HI of 17, uh, this is again another excellent case for an oral appliance. So we're looking forward to trying that. We'll see what we get tomorrow. 
Yeah, we can do just one more. Let's see what's most interesting here. I'll bring up one last example. So 13.3 was the AHI, uh, number of desaturations of 62. And again, this is another positional. So if we look here, the non-supine AHI was almost 8, and the supine AHI was 26. So definitely another person that would benefit from an oral appliance plus staying off their back.